of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the shadow. My hypnotic power had prodded your mind. <laughs> the shadow. Yes, the shadow. I'll be there in every empty room as inevitable as your guilty conscience. Because her name is Justice and her revenge for your mockery will be death. Agents of the Shadow Report For today marks the birth of the Shadowcast The only podcast on the internet Devoted exclusively to the immortal exploits Of Pulp's Dark Avenger, The Shadow I won't waste time because content is king But my hope here with this humble podcast Is to turn an all new generation on To quite possibly the richest mythology In pulp, comic, radio, serial, and cinematic fiction The Shadow Why The Shadow? you ask. Simply put, because he deserves to be known. This is a character who at one time eclipsed the popularity of any pop culture icon you can conceivably name, even at the height of their popularity in the present. He had the top-rated radio serial on Sundays in the country, and that is a much more significant statement than you would think, because when you actually look into it, radio, at the height of its relevance, achieved far greater market penetration than television at the height of its prominence. So this was an absolute cultural force. He had one of the top-selling comic books, a bi-weekly pulp magazine selling obscene numbers of copies, multiple movies, two TV pilots, and a movie serial that set the standard for an entire emerging genre. Home board games, Halloween costumes, glow-in-the-dark rings, action figures, and so very much more... All this before merchandising was the watchword of every comic character to ever weather the moonlight's glare. And it all starts with the subject of today's inaugural episode, a pioneering pulp magazine we're going to talk about today, entitled The Living Shadow, the very first issue of The Shadow magazine. Now, one of the reasons for the character's obscurity in the present, I find, is that you darn near need a diagram to explain his genesis. Whereas Superman or the X-Men can be explained away in a sentence, the Shadow was a bleeding-edge hero who spilled an awful lot of plasma while screaming his way into existence, by the way. Detective Story Magazine by famed pulp and dime novel publisher Street and Smith was, at one time, the top pulp detective publication. And when I say popular, I mean circulation was so sweeping... They went weekly for nearly half of the magazine's 30-plus year publication history. Weekly. On a literary magazine, it was huge. But as the Roaring Twenties bit the big one and the Depression-era Thirties loomed into view, there naturally came challengers to the throne. When there's that much bacon on the table, someone's gonna smell it. Chief among them, True Detective, who by the late twenties was taking a massive bite out of Detective Story circulation with writers like Dashiell Hammett all but creating the noir genre within its hallowed pages. With interest waning, Street and Smith rolled the dice on the rising medium of radio, conceiving a radio program that functioned as a, really a thinly veiled advertisement for the magazine, entitled The Detective Story Magazine Hour. Say that 12 times fast. The problem being, time strictures and the nature of radio suggested the severely truncated stories would need to be helped along by some kind of narrative agent. In this case, a radio host. And of course, with mysterious masked figures and nameless narrators all the rage on radio of the time, such as CBS's silver-masked tenor, Street and Smith decided they needed a mystery man of their own, functioning as a kind of moral guidepost, Greek chorus, and Dracula all rolled into one. His haunting delivery stole every second of the radio program in which he appeared. His name? The Shadow. The Detective Story Magazine Hour eh, was a bit of a dud, but The Shadow 
was a sensation. A sea of imitators hit the airwaves, and by late 1930, Street and Smith's pulp competitors were cashing in as well, featuring one-off characters of a shadowy nature. There was even a rival film called The Shadow that had nothing to do with the company or character whatsoever. It spooked Street and Smith, and in an effort to secure the IP copyright before somebody else did, they decreed a shadow magazine would have to be created, which was just as well, since by now Detective Story Magazine was being ignored, while frenzied customers were begging their local news vendor for a magazine of the shadow that literally did not yet exist. They needed it, and they needed it fast. Enter Walter B. Gibson, under the house pen name of Maxwell Grant, former journalist, current illusionist, and biographer and friend to Harry Houdini. More importantly, he was one of the fastest writers that ever lived, and best of all, his writing was damn good as well. Street and Smith, aware his blinding speed, saw he was available, and of course, hired him away in a hurry. Well, they said we better put out a magazine, get somebody to write some stories, and create a character called The Shadow, because... This name has been going over the air, and some of the people would confuse it with the magazine. So we started the Shadow Magazine. I've been doing factual writing. I've been a newspaper writer. I've written many articles on mysteries, ancient and modern, psychic subjects, and so forth. I worked for Houdini. I was writing books for him when he died. And I, that was all during the 1920s. So when this came along, I had done some fiction, and mostly of the type of the true story, the type that was supposed to be true, the confession type of stuff. And uh, when this came along and they said, how about doing four stories? Well, they, they merely wanted to establish the magazine as a quarterly. So they said, suppose we have you do a story, and if we like the story, you can do three more. And that establishes it as a quarterly, and that's the, supposed to be the end of it, unless they could find something to do with the character later. So I did the first story, and they liked it. And I did it in a hurry, so I was just building for the others. And uh, they said, go right ahead. So I did the first four. And by the time the second one was out, why, the first one was beginning to sell out, and so was the second one. And so they jumped the issue and said, keep on doing more of them. Do another four, they said. And then they said, do it monthly. Next thing, they wanted them twice a month. Well, this was the Depression. And that was a good thing to be doing. I just dropped everything else and did the shadow for 15 years. <laughs> I was sort of depression proof. Really, the quality of the character in his cast can be credited almost as much to Street and Smith having low expectations for the book as anything else. They just needed to copyright the title, so they left it all up to Walter, which in a functional context means they left him alone. And great artists and writers tend to do their best work under that editorial arrangement. The result? The Living Shadow, a magazine rushed out so quickly they didn't even have time to commission an all-new cover and reused one from a 1919 issue of a previous pulp magazine called Thrill Book, I believe. Gibson wrote the story so fast he beat the publishers to the punch on the cover, and he was forced to include a Chinatown subplot to the story to justify the screaming Asiatic gentleman's presence on the cover image they chose after he'd already finished. But how does the story stack up? Simply put, exceptional. Riveting, mysterious, atmospheric, action-packed. If they ever make a true-to-form film version of The Shadow, if they're wise, they'll base it heavily on the living shadow. And lest you believe Walter B. Gibson's story suffered for his speed, drink in this darksome prose, such as the spectral introductory sequence, which would make an ideal opening scene in any shadow movie. The fog was thick at the center of the bridge where the man stood leaning against the rail. Although the streets of New York were scarcely a hundred yards away, he might have been in a little world of his own for the only light in the midst of that cloud of black night fog came from an arc light on the bridge. Mist. Thick, black mist. Nothing but mist. It seemed to invite his plunge. Yet he hesitated, as many wait when they are upon the brink of death, until with a mad impulse he swung his body across the rail and loosened his hands. Something clamped upon his shoulder. An iron grip held him, balanced between life and death. Then, as though his body possessed no weight whatever, the man felt himself pulled around in a sweeping circle. He staggered as his feet struck the sidewalk of the bridge. He turned to confront the person who had interfered. 
He swung his fist angrily, but a hand caught his wrist and twisted it behind his back with irresistible power. It was as though the man's strength had been wrested from him when he faced a tall, black-cloaked figure that might have represented death itself, for he could not have sworn that he was looking upon a human being. The stranger's face was entirely obscured by a broad-brimmed felt hat bent downward over his features, and the long black cloak looked like part of the thickening fog. The man who had attempted suicide was too startled to speak. Fear had come upon him, and his only desire was to shrink from this grim and eerie master of the night. But he felt himself pulled across the sidewalk, and at the curb he stumbled through the open door of a large limousine, which he had not seen until that moment. His arm was freed, and he shrank into the far corner of the car. The door closed, and the car moved onward. The grim stranger was in the seat beside him, and fear still clutched the heart of the man whose life had been saved against his will. A voice spoke through the darkness. It was a weird, chilling voice, scarcely more than a whisper, yet clear and penetrating. What is your name? It was not a question. Rather, it was a command to speak. Harry Vincent, replied the man who had been deterred from self-destruction. The words had come to his lips automatically. Why did you try suicide? It was another command. Melancholy, said Vincent. He was speaking of his own accord now. Somehow, he wanted to talk. Go on, came the voice. It's not much of a story, replied Vincent. Perhaps I was a fool. I'm all alone here in New York. No job, no friends, nothing to live for. My folks are all out in the Middle West, and I haven't seen them for years. I don't want to see them. I guess they think I'm a success here, but I'm not. You are well dressed, the stranger's voice remarked. Vincent laughed nervously. <laughs> yes, he said. I'm wearing a light overcoat, and the weather hasn't scarcely begun to be chilly. But that's only appearance. Everything else is in hawk. I have one dollar and thirteen cents in actual cash. The mysterious stranger did not reply. The car was rolling along a side street. The bridge was now far behind. Vincent, his nerves somewhat settled, stared into the opposite corner of the limousine, vainly seeking to observe his companion's face. But the shade was drawn, and he could not even detect a blotch amid the darkness. What about the girl? came the voice. The penetrating whisper startled Vincent. The single and most important item that he had omitted from his brief story had been fathomed by this stranger whose cunning was the equal of his strength. The girl? questioned Vincent. The girl? My, my girl out home? Yes. She married another man, said Vincent. That was the reason I was on the bridge tonight. I might have struggled on for a while if I hadn't been so hard up, but when the letter came that told me she was married, well... That ended it. He paused, and hearing no reply, added to his confession. The letter came two days ago, he said. I haven't slept since. I was on the bridge all night, but I didn't have nerve to jump. Then, I guess it was the fog that helped me this time. Your life, said the stranger's voice slowly, is no longer your own. It belongs to me now, but you're still free to destroy it. Shall we return to the bridge? I don't know, blurted Vincent. This is all like a dream. I don't understand it. Perhaps I did fall from the bridge, and this is death that I am now experiencing. Yet it seems real, after all. What good is my life to anyone? What will you do with it? I shall improve it, replied the voice from the darkness. I shall make it useful. I shall risk it, too. Perhaps I shall lose it, for I have lost lives just as I have saved them. This is my promise. Life, with enjoyment, with danger, with excitement, and with money. Life above all, with honor. If I give it, I demand obedience. Absolute obedience. You may accept my terms, or you may refuse. I shall wait for you to choose. The car rolled on comfortably through the side streets of Upper New York. The motor seemed noiseless. Harry Vincent began to understand how it had approached him unheard upon the bridge. He was wondering about his strange companion, this being who had whirled him away from his fatal plunge as though his hundred and seventy pounds had been nothing, this personage who could read his thoughts and whose questions were commands. He turned again toward the darkened corner and hope returned to him. After all, he wanted life. 
He had come to New York because he had desired to live and to succeed. This was his opportunity. He pictured his lifeless body beneath the bridge, and he realized that he could make but one choice. I accept, he said. I love that interchange specifically because you get the faintest glimpse of the motivations beneath the billowing cloak. I've said it before, but the Shadow is no mere crime fighter. There's a philosophy there. There's a worldview. It's not expressly political, but there is a central guiding principle. No one who appoints himself judge, jury, and executioner could conceivably operate without one. We'll get far juicier bits of it later, but even the briefest taste of his outlook on the worth of life and the importance of honor is a bit of fascinating shadow world building, and it's because of character attributes like this we would later get objectivist comic characters like The Question, Mr. A, and their lackluster Alan Moore parodies Rorschach and V for Vendetta. I do not want to spoil the entire story here, and I won't, but in brief, Everything about the Shadow and his agents in this story is some of the finest Mysterioso writing ever conceived in the pulp era. Everything else? Eh, serviceable, but better would follow. The mystery itself is well constructed, but the central antagonist, eh, satisfactory at best. What really sells it all is the atmosphere. Walter Gibson doesn't get near enough credit for how he crafts an environment. It's particularly potent during the stealth sequences. A shadow fell on the floor beside his desk. It was a peculiar shadow, long and narrow. It was almost like the shadow of a human being. Had there been a sound, Bingham's eyes might have wandered to the floor. But shadows are noiseless. The old man's ears heard nothing. The shadow was noiseless on the floor, and Bingham did not observe it when he turned his chair and swung away from the desk, still clutching the sealed envelope. He did not glance toward the window as he walked by, so he did not see that the lower sash was raised. He went to the wall where the steel door stood, and drawing a key from his pocket, unlocked the barrier. The door swung open toward the window, going back against a blank stretch of wall. The front of the safe was visible, and the old lawyer crouched before it as he worked the dial. Although his body partly obscured the front of the safe, there were slight clicks that might have been heard, for the old man was deliberate in his movements. As the door of the safe opened in the opposite direction from the steel door, something happened behind Ezekiel Bingham. Something which he did not see, and which even his keen ears did not hear. An arm appeared through the window. It was a long arm, and it reached out toward the edge of the steel door. Long, supple fingers touched the key that was still in the lock and drew it free. The arm disappeared through the wide bars of the window. The lawyer was placing the sealed envelope in a compartment of the safe. The arm reappeared. The hand held the key, and it again sought the steel door. The fingers sought to slip the key back in its place. They did not succeed at first, for the task was difficult. Finally, they made a delicate motion, and the peculiar piece of metal found its proper resting place. The steel door moved slightly inward as the key entered the lock. The slight sound it made was lost as the lawyer closed the door of the safe and spun the dial. The hand began to draw away empty. It moved quite slowly. Then it stopped. Ezekiel Bingham had turned and was staring at a spot on the floor. A shadowy blotch appeared there. The lawyer was studying it. He rose, and as his own shadow moved, the blot on the floor appeared to fade. The hand was gone, and Bingham had not seen it in the flesh. The old lawyer gazed suddenly at the window. It was now closed at the bottom. He did not know that it had been opened. Yet he seemed perplexed. He turned and crouched before the safe, then arose and watched his shadow. No, it was not the same. He repeated the experiment. Still, he was not satisfied. He went quickly to the window and opened the lower sash. He peered through the bars toward the lawn. There were shadows there. Shadows that seemed to move as the night breeze rustled the trees and bushes. A long shadow flitted over the lawn and vanished. But the keen, piercing eyes of the lawyer could detect nothing else. He had removed his reading glasses and was staring with his far-sighted eyes. He closed the window and laughed. He turned back and shut the steel door with a clang. He removed the key and placed it in his pocket. <laughs> Shadows, he murmured. When people worry about shadows, their minds begin to wander. Croker talked of shadows. What was it he screamed the night he died? The shadow. That was it. Perhaps the shadow is a living being, but if he is, what of it? The old man laughed again. 
He went back to his desk and began to write. <laughs> Shadow were his words. Some people have wild imaginations. A faint laugh seemed to mock the lawyer's words, a laugh that issued feebly from the walls of his room. Ha! <laughs> snorted Bingham. Just a scurrying feed of rats. What we have here is an ingenious storytelling conceit, one which I would argue would lend itself uniquely to a film adaptation. Basically, the titular shadow is all but unseen in his own story, an utter and complete mystery to the reader and all whom he encounters. What little we glean comes from the criminals he menaces and the baffled speculations of his agents. Vincent stared wonderingly at the speaker, and Claude Fellows added a further explanation. I have told you this with a purpose, Vincent. The methods of the man we call the Shadow are unfathomable. He's entirely unconcerned about any methods you, I, or anyone else may use in an attempt to discover his identity. To him, we are no more than children. I discovered that some time ago. I am giving you the information to save you further useless effort. Vincent stroked his chin in speculation. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions, Mr. Fellows? Ask me any question if you wish, replied the insurance broker. Have you seen the shadow? quizzed Vincent. I don't know. Does he live here in New York? I don't know. What is his purpose in life? I don't know. Is he a crook? I don't know. Is he on the side of the law? I don't know. Vincent laughed, and even Fellows indulged in a serious smile. You see, Vincent, said the insurance broker in an affable tone, I know very little. I receive messages from the Shadow, and I reply to them. What he writes to me and what I write to him is all forgotten. Remember the answer I have given to your questions. Those three words, I don't know, are often useful. You're right, admitted Vincent. I'll remember them. There's a rather brilliant twist near the end of the story here. Although it's a narrative device Gibson would employ so many times hereafter, it almost became old hat, but in this story, it's exceptional. Also interesting is the first appearance of the criminal, Diamond Burt, who would be the first of many recurring villains in later Shadow stories, namely the excellent Chinese Discs, an augury of one of Walter Gibson's greatest inventions, which is the supervillain. Diamond Burt is, of course, far from it. He's just a street tough. But from Diamond Burt and his recurring role, we eventually land on Shi Wan Khan, the Voodoo Master, and others, and without them, who knows what superhero comics would look like. It's impossible to overstate the impact of this single pulp magazine. Not only was it so popular, it went from quarterly to bi-monthly to monthly to twice a month, but from it flowed not only the superhero phenomenon that would dominate the golden age of comics 10 years later, not to mention the box office in the modern day, but it brought back an entire genre of pulp magazines that predominated the next two decades to follow. And that, of course, is single character vigilante pulps. Doc Savage came tumbling after, The Spider, Secret Agent X, and so very many others. Dime novels devoted to a single character were all the rage in the late 19th century. But when that phenomenon died off, common logic dictated publishers should switch to an anthology format. Street and Smith's Nick Carter character, an American gumshoe who predates Sherlock Holmes, by the way, and was an incidental inspiration for The Shadow, had actually turned into Detective Story magazine when single-character pulps died off sometime during World War I. The Shadow, ironically a spin-off from Detective Story's radio adaptation, brought the entire genre back. Perhaps most impressively, it would create an entire literary mythos for the Shadow character, populated with a living, breathing world of agents, antagonists, and put-upon police detectives, and all the while, a central character who was revealed to the reader one wrinkle at a time. In the second and third issues, the Shadow was suggested to be Lamont Cranston. Shortly thereafter, it was apparent he was merely playing the playboy in question, and his true identity remained a mystery. In this first issue, it suggested he was an aviation hero of the Great War, permanently disfigured in the conflict, hence the cloak and hat. I seen a shadow again, said Spotter eagerly. Down by the pink rat. This time I looked for his face. I saw nothing but a piece of white that looked like a bandage. Maybe the shadow ain't got no face to speak of. Looked like the bandage hid something in back. There was a young guy once who the crooks was afraid of. He was a famous spy in a war, and they say he was wounded over in France. Wounded in the face. 
I think the shadow is this guy. Come back. Shortly thereafter, he was seen removing an elaborate facial apparatus during a disguising sequence, suggesting his face was effectively gone. You're welcome, the question. During which he sculpts his own face into another as if from clay. Like the master illusionist who wrote this character, every time you thought you had the answer to the riddle of the shadow, he changed the questions. On the Pope's, he played the part of Lamont. There was a real Lamont Cranston, but the shadow appeared as Lamont Cranston. That was one of the many gimmicks that we had. Uh, Cranston was a world traveler, and the shadow, who wanted to keep his own identity a secret, would just take over when, whenever Cranston left. And uh, Cranston finally found that out. And that was when the shadow showed up one night around midnight, and Lamont Cranston woke up and found himself looking at himself. For the first time, he found out what was going on. But the shadow told him that, uh, he said, don't put it to the test. He said, I know more about you and your family and everything than you know yourself. If anybody gets kicked out, you'll be kicked out. Walter Gibson himself explained this technique for writing shadow stories in the Duand history of the shadow. Quote, when I first started writing shadow stories, I had two things to do, create a character and devise a plot. I treated them as one and therewith made a chance discovery. It was this, build a lead character and a story will build itself around him. In a sense, the lead character becomes the plot, or at least the main portion of it. This is by no means as obvious as it sounds. It does not mean to construct a character, equip him with a lot of things that will please you and may catch the reader. That's as far away from it as beginning with a solid plot and then jamming a lead character into it. If the character is to be the personalization of the plot, he must develop with it. You must treat your character as a discovery rather than your own creation. Treat him not just seriously, but profoundly. Picture him as real and beyond you, in mind as well as prowess. Feel that however much you have learned about him, you can never uncover all. This mental attitude gives you a deeper knowledge of the character than the story itself discloses. This pulp is in print, by the way, in issue number 47 of the Sanctum Shadow reprints, which you can find on AdventureHouse.com or the Radio Archives, and it appears alongside the seminal shadow story, The Black Hush, which famously predicted the advent of EMP technology and the great New York blackout, but we'll get to that gold mine a little later. Meantime... If you guys want to start reading The Shadow along with me, don't complicate things. We're going to skip around. We won't review a pulp issue every single week. But go ahead and start at the beginning. Hit the first ten in order. The Living Shadow, Eyes of the Shadow, The Shadow Laughs, The Red Menace, Gangdom's Doom, The Death Tower, The Silent Seven, The Black Master, Mobsman on the Spot, and Hands in the Dark. Then jump in whatever direction you like. I certainly will. Most stories are encapsulatory, but there is a mythos that builds as the stories go on. Characters introduced earlier and later that have significant bearing on the Shadow's crusade against evil, so there is a kind of continuity. So why does the character work? Walter Gibson later explained the exact reason why. The Shadow is evil visited against evil, a knight on a black horse who clothes himself in the garb of evil and even employs their tactics, murder, stealth, impersonation, subversion, but turns them back against them. But he's not just a 1940s Punisher. There's a method to the shadow squaring the scales of justice. A lesson has to be learned, whether it's symbolic decapitations against a multi-headed criminal syndicate known as the Hydra, or employing an optical illusion to vanquish a voodoo illusionist, or in this story, where a criminal commits impersonation and the shadow learns information crucial to his discoveries by impersonating someone himself. The shadow finds a way to give moral as well as lethal restitution to the victims and finality to his foes. Some of his snares are easily as sadistic as any supervillain could conceivably devise, as you'll see in the coming episodes. Buy this book, then buy its brothers. I promise you won't regret it. Today's episode is all about beginnings, and as such, I'll be reviewing one more debut, The Shadow's first appearance on film. Now, most people think the first Shadow film was in 1994, starring Alec Baldwin, which we'll certainly get to at some point, but in support of my earlier contention that the Shadow was bigger at his height than most comic characters are even now, the Shadow has been featured in seven separate feature films, a total Batman only managed to equal this decade, six of which 
were from before the end of the 40s and appearing in at least two separate serials as well. We discussed the Detective Story magazine hour, namely the Shadow's shameless, shall we say, overshadowing of it. But sadly, to our knowledge, no episodes of the Detective Story radio program seem to have survived the ravages of time. However, if you want a pristine picture of how the original Shadow actor Frank Reddick would have sounded in his role as the ethereal narrator, there is one avenue for you to do so. Track down the rare, but very much available, Detective Story magazine film shorts from Universal Studios in 1931, less than a full year after The Shadow's radio debut. What appears on this film is as sincere a recreation of an episode of the Detective Story Magazine Hour as you're ever likely to witness, not only in its Mystery of the Week format, but by casting in the role of The Shadow none other than his actor on radio, the immortal Frank Reddick. And as you can hear and see, he is superb. Money. Thousands of dollars in vaults. A woman greedy for love, for gold. Watch carefully while this story comes to life. <laughs> Now, these are mercifully brief serials. I say mercifully because I guess after they recorded the first episode, they cheaped out at mock speed, moved production to California, and recast the Shadow as a total rando who sounds utterly ridiculous. Crime does not pay. You cannot escape the penalty of the law. <laughs> Which is a shame because the mysteries themselves actually improved incrementally. As it stands, only one episode of the film shorts features Frank Reddick, the fun but somewhat formulaic burglar to the rescue, which is exactly what I will review today. It's kind of a solid glimpse into Depression-era financial paranoia, where a prominent banker embezzles funds to pay for his flapper floozy, who breaks up with her salt and pepper paramour as soon as she finds out where the cash is coming from, by the way. A girl can't afford to get mixed up in a mess like this, and you know it. Steve, I'm traveling right now. No, no, wait, Mary. I can't. And I warn you, Steve, I'm sorry. But if you tell anyone I was here tonight, I'll swear it wasn't so. I haven't been here. Understand? Mary. Goodbye. This thought runs out on her sugar daddy, but it turns out it's not the first time he stole some cash, as he pinned a previous crime on an ex-employee, a man with a limp, who happens to get out of prison at the exact same time. I'm going to save you, Corley, by killing you. That's why I'm here. I brooded and brooded on how you stole that 5,000 and made me pay the price. I used to lie awake nights and kill you in my thoughts. I told Jim Holt what I meant to do, and he told me to empty the whole gun of you. Ah, uh, but there is a silver-haired lining. If the money is stolen, he can claim all the cash was stolen by the burglar and get away with it all over again. He cuts a hasty deal with the intruder when he comes to collect his vengeance, of course, and it appears he's in the clear until he notices the gunman suddenly lost his limp. <laughs> Say, when you get to the pen, Give my regards to Jim Holt. <laughs> well, so long, you great, big, beautiful, dignified banker. <laughs> and for me, that's kind of where the works fall apart, frankly. Uh, Corley's questioned by the dumbest detective in human history, who has every angle figured, but doesn't see any coincidence in the fact that Corley says someone robbed him but it couldn't have possibly been Jack. On the same day Jack's cellmate was coincidentally released from the pen, one can see why this serial never reappeared, folks. It's a rush job, not at all equal in quality to Detective Story Magazine, which published some of the best ever written, including Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie. But we all know the moment he's clapped in irons is just an excuse for us to hear the sibilant strains of Frank Reddick's shadow reading the final sentence. <laughs> Does crime ever pay? I alone know, for I am in the shadow. Watch for me. You shall see me soon again. <laughs> The 
Detective Story magazine shorts are not great, but if you're a Shadow fan and you want to hear a piece of history we'll probably never truly get to experience, and you can find it, go for it. This concludes the latest missive from the Shadow cast. I've already recorded another episode and I'm working on another, so we'll try a monthly schedule for a bit and see if I can keep it. If you enjoyed the show, let the word out, as I won't be imbibing over much in cross-promotion on my other channels and outlets. This is kind of for my personal pleasure. I really don't care how big the audience is. The Shadow cast is a separate entity entirely. So until the agents assemble once more... <laughs> as you so evil... So shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. A shadow knows. <laughs>